Thanks very much, Senator. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a, uh, a great pleasure uh, to be here. Um, I've entitled my uh, discussion uh, this afternoon, uh, Policy Advice by Post-it Note, FOI, Deliberative Documents and Candor. Um, and I'd like to, uh, to use this opportunity to conduct a little survey. So uh, later on, um, I'll be uh, asking for a little bit of audience uh, participation in my presentation, but just to, uh, to get things off on the right note, um, I imagine that many people here this afternoon are, are or have been uh, senior public servants in uh, the Commonwealth Government, uh, the New Zealand Government or uh, a state or territory government. And I'd be interested uh, if you could just uh, perhaps by a show of hands indicate how many people in this room uh, are in those roles at the moment, senior public servants. So probably at least half, possibly slightly more. Um, now everyone's seen the fact that we have a large number of uh, people in those roles and uh, later on I'll be asking you to, uh, to work with me in a little survey so uh, there's no room to hide in this room. You've all outed yourselves and uh, we'll come back and uh, talk to you later on. But firstly, let, uh, let me give you a, a, a very personal and brief history of my involvement uh, with uh, FOI. The Commonwealth uh, Freedom of Information Act has been very par much part of my professional life since its introduction in 1982. Indeed, in that year, I was a, a junior public servant, I think an APS 6 in, in old terms, working in the Department of Immigration in Brisbane. I was asked by the regional director of the department to be the contact point for this new process that was occurring, uh, the freedom of information process, and that I should receive and handle and uh, consider any FOI applications that came into the department's Brisbane office. On the first day that the legislation um, operated, I waited expectantly, hopeful of being one of the first public servants to receive this new type of administrative application. Some weeks went by. I waited. Fortunately, I had many other things to do. But it was indeed quite a while, some weeks, before we received the very first FOI application addressed to the Department of Immigration in Brisbane. It was the first of what have now been probably hundreds of thousands or possibly millions that have been received by that department and certainly the millions that have been received by Commonwealth departments and agencies um, over the... Uh, uh, the 30 plus years that the Act has been in operation. Like the vast majority of those applications, the very first one that we received was quite straightforward and uncontroversial. It was an application by a, uh, um, a, a client of the department to have access to the department's uh, files about him. There were no complications or difficult issues to consider. But I must say that the act of copying those documents and providing them to our client did have a a strange feeling about it because until that time such documents had been routinely, routinely treated as confidential. The same applicant also had for the first time the opportunity to read the internal policy guidance that related to his immigration application. Over the years I considered many FOI requests. Some did raise issues such as where materials had been provided on a confidential basis or where there were law enforcement or national security matters associated with the documents. But overwhelmingly, the FOI Act worked reasonably effectively to provide a strong degree of transparency to the workings of government, particularly in relation to decisions about individuals. These developments, which seemed major 33 years ago, now seem completely routine. Very properly, FOI legislation has fulfilled its intentions of opening our government and playing part of a wider series of reforms provided through our administrative law framework. In particular, it's helped people better understand the rules applicable to them and decisions that personally affect them. And it's thus, in my view, improved our overall decision-making arrangements. Many years after I processed that first FOI application, I was a Deputy Secretary in the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet, uh, responsible for machinery of government and administrative law um, issues, amongst other uh, things. Subsequently, I was a Secretary of two Commonwealth Departments, as the Senator said, Immigration and then Agriculture. I was also a long-term member of the Administrative Review Council, um, which was established back in 1975 uh, with uh, Michael Kirby as its first President. The ARC was established under the Administrative Appeals Tribunal Act to be the preeminent advisory body to the Commonwealth Government on matters of administrative law. It was my privilege while on that council to work with many eminent jurists, 
academics, barristers and administrators. Now, I mention that just to say that one of the inquiries that we undertook was to examine modern methods of administrative decision making, particularly where rights and entitlements are calculated not by humans but by um, automated means. Uh, rather than the exercise of a judgment of a living human person, increasingly taxation, in, uh, um, uh, taxation decisions and pension and benefits entitlements are calculated by a computer program. FOI issues were pertinent to that as well because of course there are real questions as to in fact how the rules are designed and coded and ultimately put into the way that decisions are made. I give those examples of the first application and then more modern aspects of FOI simply to indicate that the issues of public access to government uh, records and uh, the effective working of government were matters that occupied much of my professional career over more than three decades. More broadly, the period of time since I joined the Australian Public Service has seen an extraordinary explosion in data held by governments and I'm delighted to be associated with this conference which allows a strong examination of transparency and engagement in the information age. I'm told, I'm not absolutely sure if this is correct, but I have been told by reputable sources that on a global level, the same amount of data that the world captured from the year 1900 until 2014 is now being placed on the internet every 48 hours. And it's predicted that that will drop to 24 hours by 2020. Now I grant you that probably half of that are cat videos that people place on uh, Facebook, um, but uh, um, all of us would agree that there's now an extraordinary amount of data um, and real questions uh, uh, emerge as to its proper use. And I'll be very interested to hear um, from our other speaker this afternoon um, as to some of the more contemporaneous issues around uh, the aspects of uh, data and its management and its availability. But let me now turn to the issue of policy formulation and how FOI can be relevant to that. Of course, as a long-term senior public servant, much of my work consisted, um, uh, consistent with that of my peers was in relation to policy formulation in assisting governments make decisions on key aspects of policy uh, and indeed administration. My career involved me in many uh, aspects of the development of policies associated with uh, immigration, and citizenship, uh, refugee, asylum and humanitarian issues, multiculturalism, national security and in my final years in government, agriculture and biosecurity. I had the privilege to work as a Chief of Staff to a Cabinet Minister with many Ministers and Parliamentarians and their staff and with many senior officials. And you'll agree, I suspect, that in many of those areas there were often contentious uh, issues associated uh, with those areas of public policy. So what are the key aspects of good policy formulation? Some of these are obvious, such as making sure that policy makers start with a clear objective of what they're trying to achieve, and that stakeholders who are likely to be impacted um, uh, by any proposed changes or have views um, uh, have the opportunity to contribute those to the policy formulation process. However, today I'd like to very briefly concentrate on two practices of good policy formulation that sometimes can be overlooked. The first of those, I believe, is contestability. At a broad level, this involves subjecting all proposals, concepts and assumptions to rigorous scrutiny, so as to maximise the likelihood that final policy decisions are as best placed, uh, best made as possible. The public service plays an uh, essential contestability role. It has a duty to ensure that policy development processes draw on a range of perspectives and the best available evidence. Moreover, the public service has a responsibility to ensure that ministers are aware of all practical options and the relative costs and benefits associated with these. The second practice of good policy formulation I'd like to highlight is the provision of written advice. While face-to-face -face briefings, chewing the fat, those sorts of corridor discussions or uh, even more formal discussions uh, can be an important way in bringing key stakeholders up to speed and developing uh, broad ideas, I believe that good policy development must be underpinned by the written word. Unlike oral advice, written advice has less room for misinterpretation or evil forgetfulness. It's a key prerequisite, in my view, to candour 
and honesty in policy advice. More importantly, it's generally only through the process of transmitting concepts and arguments into written advice that their strength or weaknesses become apparent. And it leaves, of course, a proper record for, at a later date, a historic account of what's actually occurred. So is there a conflict between candour and disclosure? Let me emphasise that I genuinely believe that there are sound public policy reasons for transparency and disclosure, but not at any price. I'm certainly not the first person to speak on this topic. I've just outlined some elements of what are seen as good policy formulation practices. But in my mind, the question thus arises, does the reality or the perception of possible public disclosure of deliberative documents subvert good policy formulation? It's no surprise that uh, I've entitled my speech today around that very question. My comments today are based very much on my own personal experience in government. But I thought it was appropriate that I also take the opportunity over the last few weeks to have discussions with a significant number of former colleagues who have headed Commonwealth government departments and agencies or indeed worked as advisors to ministers. And I should say at this point that my working notes and records of the persons with whom I've talked are not subject to any FOI legislation. And as I've guaranteed to those colleagues, there's no chance whatsoever of disclosure of their identities. So my comments here today may not pass standards of academic rigour, but I can assure you that they are genuinely researched and widely based. To a person, all of my interlocutors had the same experiences as me and broadly shared my views. We all have had experiences, we've all had very real examples of where the quality and type of policy advice on major public policy issues has been impacted adversely because of concerns, real or imagined, that written materials would be the subject of disclosure through FOI processes or review mechanisms. One notable example, of course, have been the numerous requests for incoming government briefs, both for the successful government and the uh, unsuccessful uh, party, prepared during the caretaker period. But there are many, many, many other examples. It is our view that a number of behaviours have resulted because of these concerns of disclosure. I should say that they're certainly not universal. They're not the preserve of one minister or indeed one government or indeed any particular group of senior officials, but they are real and they are regularly displayed. There have been requests or directives that key issues either not be put in writing or provided in handwriting. Indeed, the use of the ubiquitous post-it notes has been the stuff of jokes, but it's real. At least one departmental secretary advised me last week that they keep no less than four post-it note pads on their desk of varying sizes, depending upon how many comments they wish to make. That secretary, who has extensive experience in government, used to make frank written comments directly on submissions and briefings. They now put those comments on detachable post-it notes. They are far more circumspect than in the past on their writing on the formal document itself. There is only one reason why they put their documents on disposable notes. There has been pressure to classify materials as being cabinet in confidence when their association with cabinet processes is slim to seek to attract exemptions from disclosure because they have been classified in that way. There have been suspicions that material put in writing has been motivated improperly to set up a minister in the circumstances that the materials will subsequently be disclosed under FOI. And some players, particularly following the, recent go the previous government's amendments to the FOI legislation, actively sought to work around the government's stated commitments to disclosure. Now, I accept that the perception of potential disclosure is perhaps much worse than the reality, but the perception alone has been a powerful determinant of the behaviours that I've just outlined. And this doesn't overcome the fact that, in my view, and that of many of my peers, the quality of engagement, the quality of the policy formulation process between the most senior levels of the public service and ministers and their advisers has been adversely impacted by the potential 
of disclosure of deliberative material. Speaking generally, there is less candour and rigour in the system. There is less trust in, in what should be the most trusted of relationships. Put simply, we now see a practice where routinely journalists, advocacy groups and non-government political parties use FOI applications to seek to access deliberative documents. Now I know that there are fees applicable to such applications, but in my view the true cost of this activity is much greater than that recovered by the fees regime. These FOI applications are having the effect that there seems to be much more interest in the process than the outcome as far as government decision making is concerned. And I don't accept the views put by some that access materials of this nature is essential for the proper functioning of our democracy or to, to shed a spotlight on government decision making. There are many other ways to seek accountability. We have an Auditor General, an Ombudsman, a Human Rights Commission, the Parliament, Parliamentary Committees and the Courts. They all provide mechanisms and avenues. And secondly, the system has got to the point that some documents that should have been created are simply not been created in the first place with unsatisfactory oral discussions, post-it notes or other handwritten materials substituting. What's newsworthy in our era of rapid news cycles and social media is conflict and disagreement. A fashion has developed of seeking to portray senior public servants as political operators rather than allowing the preservation of that position of trust between ministers and senior public servants. As I outlined above, I believe that a robust policy environment requires debate and it needs to value the differences of views. But while ministers and their officers and senior officials believe that that debate can be politically damaging, some have become intolerant of communicating and countenancing in a way that promote, would promote such a debate. And we, as a community, are thus receiving less than optimal policy outcomes. And indeed, I worry that the official records of key policy deliberations from our current era will be far more bland, more anodyne than in times past. The colour and vibrancy of a good policy formulation process is being removed. It's being removed from the written record, leaving only a partial memory of what really happened or what should have happened. Now, one possible response is to simply accept the reality of this situation. But should we? Should we settle for a second-rate, partially broken policy formulation model? Surely we deserve better. I believe that there's a greater public interest in a strong and candid policy formulation environment than there is in the potential disclosure of documents associated with that policy formulation. Indeed, I believe that there should be a re-examination of whether processes associated with conclusive certificates should be re uh, restored and whether the exemptions available for cabinet in conference material, which are designed to preserve candour at the centre of government, whether those exemptions should be broadened to a wider class of deliberative documents. I'm sure that everyone here is familiar with the Home Insulation Program Royal Commission, which reported last year. One of the government's responses to the Royal Commission report was to appoint Professor Peter Shergold, the former Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, my old boss, to lead an independent review of government processes for the development and implementation of large public sector programs and projects, including the roles of ministers and public servants. The review is due for completion soon. It will indeed be interesting to see what Peter has to say in relation to this issue of disclosure and candour. So let me conclude by saying that I'd like to extend my survey of former colleagues to all of those senior public servants that are in the room here this afternoon. But I am concerned to ensure that your identities are protected, uh, that we can um, ensure that there's not disclosure um, of what you're about to do. So I ask that everyone in the room firstly shut your eyes so you don't see anyone else. Secondly, I ask that all of those senior public servants raise one of their hands so at least I can see who you are. Come on everyone, oh, there were more hands up before. So. Now, I ask you to put down your hand if you answer yes to either of these questions. The first question, have any of you ever been told directly or indirectly by a minister, an advisor or a more senior colleague not to put major policy or administrative issues in writing on the basis that they may be disclosed as a result of a subsequent FOI request? 
And secondly, have any of you ever held back in providing the full range of arguments and issues in relation to a matter because you feel you would not be thanked for that candour or would not feel comfortable having the materials placed in the public domain and pos possibly the subject of media comment? There are still one or two hands. Thank you, everyone. You can put your hands down. Now, my original speech notes now, uh, originally said, uh, well, you now see that there are no hands remaining. Um, there were three hands remaining out of a room of several dozen people who were senior public servants. So my experiment has worked in that we've achieved both disclosure and candour. I'd like to meet those three people and ask them where they work later on. Um, but I believe that our little survey here, which sought to achieve both, uh, both disclosure and candour, does not reflect the reality that we see and that currently our FOI legislation does not have that result. Thank you very much. So.